And this is what I played for him. Hello, this is Cuckoo Town and I'm your host, Mark Anthony Wyatt. Our intention here is to serve you up a delicious smorgasbord of strange, all that weird stuff that we know you love too. With the assistance of my co-host Janice and occasional guests, we'll also be delving deeply into an indefinable place, a liminal space where high strangeness meets high creativity. The place where the magic happens, where the spark that gives us inspiration abides and the muse resides. Welcome to episode four, High Strangeness at the Ridge cemetery we were recently very kindly invited by the first class paranormal investigator and writer larry wilson to one of his regular haunts yes i know it's a terrible pun it's the ridge cemetery in shelby county illinois now larry has investigated this creepy location well over 50 times in the last few years this area has everything bigfoot ghosts ufos cattle mutilations anomalous voices strange lights hooded figures even black panthers larry for those of you who don't recognize the name is very highly respected in the midwest area by everyone who knows him he's passionate about these mysteries that enthrall us all he was a private detective during his working days and he's applied those skills to his paranormal investigations he's investigated some of the most famous haunted locations around the US, including the Villisca Axe Murder House in Iowa. He appears to have no fear, as he frequently investigates very creepy locations totally on his own. We were very lucky to be invited along. I would just like to add that this was an outdoor audio recording, obviously. It was on a hillside, an exposed hillside in places. Uh, There's a little bit of wind noise and some leaf rustling going on occasionally, but I didn't want to overdo the editing. I wanted it to sound natural. It was an outdoor conversation. Enjoy. We're at Williamsburg Hill Ridge Cemetery, which is located in South Central um, Illinois. About uh, we're about seven to eight miles as the crow flies from the small community of Tower Hill, Illinois. And the history of the hill basically is back in the 1830s to uh, sometime in the 1840s. There was a small village on the hill here that basically died out when a stagecoach route that went over the hill decided to abandon the hill because the railroad was coming soon through the area. So okay. so basically when the railroad uh, decided to, to bypass the hill, the village died out. You know, So right. it's been a, basically um, a handful of people still live out here on the hill, yeah, but yeah. mainly farmers uh, that live out here. Oh, right. but, uh, but again, we're South Central Illinois. So we're, we're strolling up the hill. So one, of the, one of the really, really strange stories that happened took place right here in the parking lot. Um, one of the weird things about the area out here is how the, the road that leads to the cemetery just kind of, you're driving down this gravel road and all of a sudden it dead ends right at a graveyard, you know. And, yes, yeah. Um, I interviewed a lady back in 2006. Her name was Kathy. And she told me that earlier that year, I believe it was April of 2006, that she and her husband came out here early one morning and they were going to do some mushroom hunting in the nearby woods. Right. They pull in, and as you can see, it's kind of a um, uh, turnabout-type driveway. Well, they, they pulled a, their pickup truck around, and they backed in against the cemetery gate with the truck facing the road as they came in on. And uh, she said that um, we had just got out of the truck. My husband had made his way down the embankment here, which I'm pointing to, which would be the south. Yes. Uh, the husband went down the embankment. The wife starts to follow suit. And the husband yells back up, can you get me a bottle of water out of the truck? So she turns around, comes back up the hill. And when she does, standing in front of the truck is this elderly gentleman. She said he has like brown uh, pleated pants on, snow white hair combed back. He's got a, um, she called it like a silk type shirt. Right. His pants were pleated. Right. And she said he had the uh, wingtip type shoes. But he was standing right. right against the bumper of their truck, just looking straight up the road. Yeah. So she said, I kind of cautiously approached the man because we, yeah. never, we didn't pass him on the road. And, and when we pulled up, we didn't see anybody in the cemetery. No, no. So anyhow, she uh, she starts approaching the man and she says, can I help you? Well, he didn't respond to her first question. Right. She said, I moved a little bit closer, but was still leery of the man. I said, you know, can I help you with something? Yeah. She said, without 
batting an eye, looking up the road, he said, can you tell me where the bars are? <laughs> what frightened me was, wow. he spoke, but his lips didn't move. Uh, and she said, that just sent chills through me when that I'm happened. I'm getting chills just here. <laughs> but she says, he <laughs> continues to look up the road. And so I ask him again, um, excuse me, you, what can she, I help you with? And, she, and he says again, can you tell me where the bars are? Off. So she said at that point, I didn't want to move any closer. So she starts heading down the embankment and calls for her husband, Jerry. And Jerry responds. She goes, what's he want? He wants to know where the bars are because he heard him from right. down the embankment. So he heard him too. Yeah. So Jerry comes up the embankment. Kathy has her back, uh, back to the gentleman. But when Jerry gets up here and she turns around, he's gone. Wow. So they don't know where he went. So they, they, they kind of look. Well, first they looked up the road, you yes. know, and being yeah. an elderly man, just the, the few seconds that it took for Jerry to come up the embankment. And you see, yeah, we're, yeah. we're good. We're looking at about an eighth of a mile up yeah, the little hill here. There's yeah. no way he could have no. gone up the road. And she said, we didn't hear him in the woods. And as you can see, this is a thick, you know, yes. dense woods here. And she said, we, we looked in the cemetery. We didn't find him anywhere. She says, I don't know where he went, but uh, it's just like the man vanished. wondered you know in this graveyard which it's, it's it's a beautiful cemetery but in this particular area here there's there's no one buried and I couldn't figure out why that was right. uh, one day I was talking to a gentleman that lives he's lived here his entire life just over the, the south part of the hill here and uh, he told me well this area is where the Native Americans are actually buried oh, right. and he said if you would actually you know dig through the soil here he said you would eventually run into rock because that's how they would bury them you know, to keep animals from digging the graves up. Oh, right. they would put stones over the uh, over the graves yeah but a lot of times uh, when you approach this area um, it's much colder in this area than it is right and, and as you see there's no trees around so it should be rather warm in this yes, area yeah. um, but a lot of times there's just a huge uh, cold area yeah. in, in this particular spot uh, one night I was out here with um, three folks from a radio station and I placed a, a tape recorder by an actual grave over here, gravestone, just laid it kind of next to that because it was right here by this, uh, by the graveyard or by the, uh, uh, where the Native Americans are buried. And we didn't hear anything that night at all, but uh, I recorded, you'll hear whistling and then you'll hear what sounds like chanting. Uh, right. You hear like a yee, ya, hee, hee, yeah. and then you hear the whistling again. So it's, right. it, to me, it's, if that's not Native like, American chanting, yeah, I'm not sure what is, like you know. That, yeah. What is about to follow is Larry's EVP. You'll first hear some whistling, which we'll talk about some more later, and then you'll hear the part of the chant. I was out here one day shooting video and taking uh, photos, and there was a caretaker out here, and he was mowing the, mowing the cemetery. Right. And I thought, well, this might be a good idea just to ask this guy if he's ever had any weird experiences out here. So anyhow, he finishes mowing, and I approach him, and I told him that, you know, I'm a, I've been a paranormal investigator for a lot of years, and I yeah. write books, and um, I said, have you ever had anything weird happen to you out here? And he says, well, matter of fact, I have. And he said, uh, uh, my mother used to come out here with me, and I would mow, and she would take a weed whacker, would, would do the close work around the graves. Yes, yeah. And she said, he said, we uh, had finished up this one particular Sunday afternoon, and you can see that there's a tall, tall oak tree here right in the center of the, of yeah. the uh, cemetery. He said, uh, I parked my John Deere tractor right by the by the tree. Right. And he said, Mom wanted to walk over the over to the north side here and go yeah. down this embankment here to look right. at some of the older graves. Yeah. And he said, we were gone no longer than five minutes at the tops. And he said, I put the tractor in gear so it couldn't roll. And he said, we walked down to over the ridge here, come back up five minutes later, and the tractor's gone. And he said, <laughs> he said, we didn't hear, we didn't hear it start. If, he said, if, if I had, of course, I'd have ran yeah. back up here. No engine noise. No. We didn't hear any commotion or anything. And he said it was in gear, so it wouldn't roll. But he said, look around. He said, if that tractor would have rolled, it would have crashed into tombstones. Yeah, yeah you know? exactly. So he said, we, it was just gone. So he said, we walked around the perimeter of the graveyard. Finally, we're over in the um, south, um, southeast corner of the graveyard there. And I look into the woods, and there's my tractor in the woods. 
He said it's turned around facing with the front of the tractor right. facing the graveyard like it was turned around in the woods. Yeah. But he said there's no brush knocked down, there's no, no tracks, trees knocked down, no tracks, nothing into the woods. He said it's like so something just picked it up or someone picked yeah. it up and just set it in the woods. And he said I've never been able to explain it. And he also yes. told me that he said, you know, there's quite a few, the county takes care of this graveyard. And he said there's quite a few guys that won't come out here and mow. No. He said they'll mow other graveyards, but they won't mow this one. Okay. Is there any Bigfoot activity here? I'll tell you what. Uh, Actually, and this again, this would have been in 2012. The gentleman and I were out here. We're walking up the road because of the story about the old man, you know, that I told yes, you. Yeah. And uh, people also see colored lights sometimes right. in the in the trees or down that road. So we were walking up the road, and as we were coming back, uh, this gentleman is a, a deer hunter, so he had a, a flashlight, of course, and he's walking along the edge of the woods. All of a sudden, he tells me, "Hey, Wilson, look at this!" And there was we found, or he found, a large barefoot footprint. And I wore a size. 11 and a half and I put my shoe right. up against it and it was a good you know four and a half to five inches longer than my wow. foot but it was barefoot yeah. and no one in their right mind is going to be out here walking around barefoot because there's all kinds right. especially in the summer thorns rocks broken glass all kinds yes. of things you know and where we found the track it was an obscure or obscure location yeah. if you're playing a prank on someone you wouldn't put it there nobody's ever going to find it we just happened no. on it by, by chance yeah um, I was just thinking about that tractor experience it sounds it's got that sort of big foot Absolutely, it does. There's another story about this location out here. Three different groups of people told me the same story. Uh, as you see how we pulled in here, this kind of roundabout, I turned around and I pointed my vehicle facing out to exit. Yes. And pretty much every time I come out here, if there's another vehicle out here, everybody's facing the way to leave it's and like I'm not sure a quick getaway I think just, that's my opinion that's why they do it in case I have to make a quick getaway I'm ready to get out of here Run because away. at night you can't see the back up out here you have to turn around yes. first yeah but anyhow three separate groups of people have told me they've been out here in the graveyard at night and when they get in their vehicle to leave and you know of course turn the ignition on mm -hmm. headlights kick on right across the road will be a tree or a oh, log yeah mm -hmm. blocking them in yes. where they can't get out right. but here's the weird thing out here, you know, especially at night when you're around a forested area and you're surrounded by woods, right. you hear every, especially because you're in a graveyard, yeah. you hear every little sound yes. out here. Yeah. None of these folks heard anything. No, no. And one, one gentleman told me that he was with his uh, sister and uh, the sister's boyfriend and the logger, the tree was across the road. So they got out and they were strong enough where they could drag it off the road. Right. And again, it's dark out here. They start driving over the hill and before they get to the top of the hill, here comes some headlights. Right. So they pulled over to let the car pass them yes. was heading yeah. towards the graveyard. Yeah. So then they watched uh, as they were getting ready to pull back on the road, they saw the brake lights for the vehicle stop yeah. about where that tree where had been the across the road. Been. Yeah. So he, gentleman, slowly backs up and they get out. The tree is now back across the road. And this is, you're talking less than a minute. Yeah. Because they had it's to let the car pass. Yeah. That was the, yeah. Within yeah. less than a minute, the tree was back across the road. Yeah. So it's just, but again, that type of thing is also, like you said, Bigfoot type yeah, activity. Yeah, it, does, it doesn't sound like a normal. No, you know, but they just no. sort of themselves. And well, that's know. the thing about Will Hill, too. Over the years, you know, you hear about the paranormal hotspots around the world now. Um, but, you know, of course, the most famous one's probably the Skinwalker Ranch out in Utah. Yes. Uh, because of the TV shows and the books. But anyhow, yeah. this place is, is similar because they've had UFO activity out here. 1977, there were cattle mutilations just right. over the yes. eastern yeah. side yeah. of the hill. The strange lights are seen in the sky, ghostly right. activity out here, yeah. strange voices, um, just about anything you can think of. Uh, again, the yeah. footprint that we found. I mean, and there's also reports of black panthers being se seen out here. You will remember I drew your attention towards the whistling just before the chanting earlier on. This is why this next section, I'm calling it the whistling stalker. One of the weirdest things that's happened to me out here was this was the first time that I came out here by myself in the dark. Right. And the reason I did was I had planned on doing a documentary at some point, which I'd never finished, but I wanted to record some some film in infrared out here at night. Oh, yeah. So I came out here, it was about 10 o'clock at night, completely pitch black, parked in the parking lot, and I brought my equipment to the top of the hill here, uh, tripod for my camera. Yes. I set my tripod up and I filmed just, I would gradually move the camera, you know, filming in a certain area for maybe 10 minutes at a time. And I'd been filming for about a half an hour when I decided that I was gonna go down by the gate Right. The cemetery gate, the entrance gate, set my camera up the road and try to maybe hopefully get a shot of the old gentleman that they see on the road yes. up there. Yeah, yeah. So 
Anyhow, I, I left my equipment by the oak tree over here, and I just folded up the tripod, left my camera uh, on top of the tripod, and I'm starting to walk toward the gate, and I only, I only get about uh, maybe eight to 10 feet, and the direction over here, which would be the north, right. all of a sudden, you know how you know how someone can put their two four fingers under their tongue and do that come here type whistle. Yes, it's like a loud shrill whistle. Yes, uh, th again, this is pitch black out here. Right. A loud shrill come here type whistle comes from the north. Shocked me, you know, for one yeah. thing, and I'm thinking, is there somebody out here, you know? And there's uh -huh. no vehicles out here, and and you see how dense this woods is, and I've yes. walked the woods in the daytime. And it's almost impossible to maneuver around at night in there. So anyhow, I'm thinking, that sounded like someone. And then I thought, nah, that's got to be a bird of some type that I'm just not familiar with. Yeah. So I continued walking toward the gate. I get about another 10 yards. And the whistling happens again. It's, again, that come here type whistle. But it had moved about 10 to 20 yards, like following me. So I'm on edge then. And I'm yeah. thinking, that wasn't a bird. That's a person. Right. So I continue to walking. And I'm half looking out of the corner of my eye to see if I see any flashlights or anything moving. I continue down toward the gate. I get about another 10 to 15 yards. It happens again, but it's moving with me again. Yes. Um, and again, no sign of any flashlights or anything. Right. Uh, don't hear a thing. Don't uh, hear any and movement. It, and it couldn't have moved that fast. No, no. Through those woods. And, well, so what I do, couldn't. I pick up the tripod again, continue with my, you know, walking down toward the gate. I go through the gate and you see where my vehicle is, which is about yes. 10 feet from the from the woods. Yeah. Um, I set up my camera in that exact spot and I'm focusing it up the road when all of a sudden, right next to me in the, in the edge of the woods there, it comes from right there. So you're talking right. within 10 feet from me. Yes, it. yeah. But actually, what I couldn't understand is you, you can see the, the path they would have to take. It's kind of a loop path to get to where I am. Yes. I've got a straight shot to the road. They have to take, they would have to take this loop path if it was a person. Yes. Again, I didn't hear anything, didn't see any lights, but it was basically, they either arrived at the same time or beat me to the spot where I was going to set my camera up, yeah. and that's not possible. No, um, no. I talked to a hunter out here. I was telling him my story about what happened that night. First, he said, oh, it's probably some guys playing tricks on you, but when I finished the story, he said, there's no way. He said, yeah. you know, I hunt out here. He said, there's no way someone that's can make right. it from over there to over there yeah. uh, when you've got a straight shot. Yeah, I mean, that, that's the go-to reaction. Like, yeah. Oh, it's got to be somebody playing a trick. Well, but well no, it doesn't end there. Done. Yeah. When that whistling happened right next to me, I thought, if there's someone, you know, crazy in the woods, yeah. I'm not leaving my expensive equipment up there by no, the oak tree. Right. Yeah. So I turn around, lift. I left the camera running, walk back up the hill, all the way back up the hill, just like before. Yes. The whistling continued and it moved back the way it originally came. I pick up my my uh, camera up here, my tripod, packed up my not my camera, my equipment, packed it up. Walk back down to the hill, the whistling called me back down the hill, and I get to uh, my camera, and I could see, usually I could see the infrared uh, on the viewfinder screen, I uh -huh. could see that's filming up the road, Yeah, it was black, and I thought, well, that's weird, you know, so yeah. as nervous as I was, I just folded up the tripod of the camera, threw it in the front seat, uh, put my key in ignition, hoped the vehicle started, and it did, uh -huh. and I took off for home, yeah. 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 and when I get home, I went through my audio and video just to see if I recorded the whistling. I didn't record the whistling on audio, and I didn't record the whistling or record anything on video other than what I filmed up here by the tree. So there was nothing as far as the whistling recorded that night, right, which made right. no sense. The Lady in Black and the Underground Kids. The same lady, Kathy, that told me the story about the, the, the vanishing old man. Yes. Yeah. Um, she told me another story that happened to her about a year later. And she had told me that she, she lived in, or still does, lives in Payne, Illinois. Right. And she said, I'd been coming over here for 30 years, uh, had a few weird experiences, and we come over here quite often just to see if we can experience anything. Right. So she said, one morning, uh, it was myself and my uh, daughter and my, uh, my uh, granddaughter, Krista. She was six at the time. Right. Uh, we came out here to the graveyard. She, she said, matter of fact, we even brought a picnic lunch with it. We were going to have lunch out here and just spend the day, see if anything happened, you know. Right. She said, we arrive, we walk in the cemetery. She says, Krista takes off to the southeast corner of the graveyard. Right. And she says, she's playing and she's not gone very long. And all of a sudden she comes r running back, uh -huh. screaming, grandma, grandma, grandma. And they, they knew something was wrong with uh -huh. her, but they didn't know what. So she approaches them. And she says, Grandma, Grandma. And they said, well, you know, what's wrong? What's wrong? And the little girl says, she says, I was over in the corner by myself. And she said, just all of a sudden, this, I saw this woman wearing a black dress. 
Really? And she says, and they, they ask her to describe it, and what she did, she was, it was just a long black dress, kind of uh-huh. went down to the ground, yeah. and the woman had, it was a woman with gray hair, and her hair yeah. was pulled back in a bun. Yeah. So they said, well, you know, what did she want, or what did she say to you? And she said, well, the woman walked up to me, and she said, uh, do you want to play with the children? And then she said, when I asked where the children are, she said, they're under the ground. <laughs> and that's when the little girl took off running. So Kathy told me that when they told her that, she said, of course, chills just went down her spines. But she said, we went looking for the woman. Yeah. We walked over in the southeast corner. And as you can see, there's really only one way out of here, which is the, which is the gate. Yes. So yeah. they said, we walked to the southeast corner. We didn't see her. We listened. We didn't hear her in the woods. But dressed the way that my granddaughter described her, there's no uh, way a woman could make it through the woods no. dressed like that. Yeah. So she said, we... we looked up you know to the parking lot of course there's no other vehicles there right. but she said um, yeah my granddaughter was adam with this woman wanted to know if she could play with the wanted to play with the, uh, the it, children it sounds from the costume that she was you know in the 1890s or way back whatever way back yeah yeah so i had never told that story to a, a paranormal friend of mine his name was ed osborne uh i would i got acquainted with him at a paranormal meetup in springfield illinois but anyhow he wanted he'd heard me tell some stories about williamsburg hill and he wanted to come out here so i gave him directions on how to get to ridge cemetery so he and a, and a gentleman friend of his came out here on a Sunday afternoon. And Ed said, we pulled into the drive out there. And he said, we pulled up. There were no other cars there. We walk into the cemetery and start looking at some gravestones. Turn and look toward the southeast corner. Nice. And there's this woman. She's kneeled down in front of a grave, not even paying any attention to us. And he says, that, I thought that was odd because he goes, here's two strange men that she doesn't know in a rural secluded cemetery. Yeah. And she doesn't even seem concerned that we're there. You yeah. would think she would want to keep an eye on us to see what we're up to, you yes, know? Yeah. But anyhow, he said, I just turned my head for a moment, was looking at a gravestone. I looked back up to see where she went, she's and she gone. was gone. Yeah. And Ed kind of said the same, the same lady, thing. He yeah. said, basically, he said, she would have had to walk by us to get yeah. out of the cemetery. That's right. No other vehicles here to pick her up. No. And she said, uh, or he said, rather, you know, that it was just like she's there one minute and gone the next. Yeah. And then I asked him to describe her, and basically he described the same thing that the little girl did. A woman in a long black dress, hair pulled back in a bun, yeah. with gray hair. This was uh, probably a year later. I came out here with an investigator named Chris and an investigator named Janet. Janet is sensitive to spirits, right. which I didn't know until that night. So in this same specific area we're standing in right now, we're walking toward the oak tree, and I'm taking him to the southeast corner of the cemetery. All of a sudden, Janet says, "There's a, I see a woman here. And Chris and I look. We didn't see anything. Right. She says, no, there's a woman a woman standing right over there. And I said, well, what's she look like? And she says, well, she's wearing a navy blue dress. Yeah. It goes down to the ground. Got gray hair pulled back into a bun. And then it's just like a, the light bulb hit. Well, if you think about it, if someone's out here yeah. in a navy blue dress in the daytime, maybe you would mistake that for black, you know? Yes. But Janet being sensitive, maybe she was seeing the true color of yeah, that's what right. the yeah. woman wore. Yeah, but detail. it's in the exact same area where the... The girl saw the lady and yes. Ed Osborne saw the lady. The hooded man and getting lost in the woods. One of them that contacted me was a uh, logger named Scott, and he was doing some logging work for a gentleman on the east side of the hill. And he told me that he had logged in the same area the year before, and this would have been July of 2022, uh, 2020 rather, that this happened. Right. But the year before, uh, he had worked with the owner's two sons, and he said they were jokesters. So this particular afternoon, he said it was close to 100 degrees. He's out here, he gets there early, and no one else is here yet. So he said, I'm driving a skid loader. He said, that's like a big bobcat type tractor that we used to drag the logs out with. Uh He said, I'm driving it. And all of a sudden, something to my right caught my attention. And he said, when I turned and looked, he said, and I'm sitting about four and a half to five feet off the ground on this skid loader. And he said, I'm over six feet tall. And he said, my eye level would have been at least seven to eight feet up. He said, I look over and looking eye level is this behind a tree. And it's like grasping the tree, but peeking around the tree, one side to the other, is a black hooded figure. Wow. And he said, uh, I, my first thought was, these guys, the jokesters, must have got here early, and they're trying yeah. to play a prank on me. Yeah. So he said, I didn't take my eyes off the tree, shut the skid loader off. I jumped down off the skid loader, uh, loader and he said, they're about 15 yards away from me. He said, I kind of just walked fast over to the tree. And he said, I didn't take my eye off that tree all the way over there, and I jumped around the tree and yelled, gotcha. And there's nobody there. <laughs> and he said, I don't scare easy, he said, and I don't know, yeah, yeah. I didn't know if I believed in the paranormal stuff, but he said, that scared me because yes. he said there should have been somebody there. And he said, plus, yeah. you're talking almost 100 degrees out here, and there's nobody that should be out here in their right mind wearing a, a hooded jacket. No, that's right. So, anyhow, there was another gentleman out here that lives on the hill named Scott, and he's a local farmer, um, raises a few, you know, you had a livestock. 
But anyhow, he told me that he's a hunter and um, he has a path from his property in the same area of the woods that, that the uh, logger Scott told me about. He said, I have a path that's only about a 10 minute walk to my tree stand that I use for hunting deer. Right. He said, I walk, I said, I could walk that path blindfolded and find my tree stand. Uh -huh. He said, my tree stand is about 10 feet off the ground. And he said three different times now, he said, again, from my property, it's a path that's straight shot to the tree stand. Three times I have been lost. He said, it's like I walk, but I never get there. And you can see around here, these woods, that's if you would so walk in any nice. direction, 15 yes. to 20 yeah. minutes, yeah. you can get out of the woods. Right. But he said, it's like I walk and I never get there. Yes. And he said, uh, one time it even happened in the daytime, but he said twice it happened at night. And he said, I'll just have to give up and just sit down and wait for daybreak to see where I'm at. <laughs> Um, and then he said also, he said, there's been several occasions I'd be up in the tree stand. And he said, I usually get here around 4 o'clock in the morning. It's dark. It's cold. He said, I'm up in the tree stand. And he said, several times I've heard voices. And the first time I heard it, he said, I'm thinking it's coming to somebody out in the woods. But he said, this yeah. is my property. Shouldn't be anybody out here. Yeah. So he said, finally, he realized that it wasn't coming from somewhere else in the woods. The voices were right in front of his face, <laughs> 10 feet up in his tree stand. Right. And he said, out of the times that I've heard these voices, uh, some have been male, some have been female, but only one occasion could I understand what was being said. Right. And it sounded like it was a British type accent. Yeah. And he said, it simply said, nice weather we're having, you know, but he <laughs> said, that's all I needed to hear. But he said, you would think a, a hunter with a, a rifle in his hand yes. would be brave enough to get out of the tree stand and go home. But he said, I was too scared. I had to wait for daybreak before I would even climb down from the tree. <laughs> So anyhow, they've seen what look like ghoulish looking black hooded figures in the, in the timber around so the cemetery. Creepy. Regarding the getting lost in the woods piece that you heard, I would just like to say that this reminded me of quite a few weird fiction stories that I'd read over the last few years, uh, particularly one by Algernon Blackwood, which was called The Ancient Light, where, where a um, surveyor gets lost in the woods. It's, it, and it's not just getting lost in the woods, the woods entrap him. And this sort of ties into fairy lore, of course, as well. And for anybody who's thinking, yes, but that's fiction, you know, the um, weird fiction, you have to think, where did these authors, people like Blackwood, and Arthur Macken, where did they get their ideas from? They got them from listening to people's stories, from listening to real life experiences. That's where the fiction comes from. What right. happened was um, the, the people that came with me, they wanted me to take them somewhere around Halloween. I told them I would, but there were two, two girls, and I said, I can't tell you what I'm going to do, but I'll take you there, but you got to do an experiment with me. Nothing scary, nothing you have to do by yourself. Their names were Nicole and Kylie, and their stepdad, Todd, came with us. And when we pulled up in the, in the parking lot, when I raised up my hatchback to get the camping chairs and stuff out, my baseball bat was there, and they said, well, what's this for? And I said, well, I don't carry a gun, and I've run into a few undesirables out here, so I always bring the bat with me. And so anyhow, that night, we weren't planning to sing the whole night, but I wanted to test them on the particular grave here. So we'd been here about a half hour, and we basically set our camping chairs up in this area around here. And at one point, I said, okay, now we're going to try our experiment. And I said, Nicole, you come with me first. And it was really, really dark. You can't yes. see this out here in the night because the, if there's any cloud cover or yeah, if it's a yeah. new moon or something, you can't see your hand in front of your face. So anyhow, I guided uh, Nicole backwards to about two and a half, three feet in front of the grave, about where I'm standing now. And I said, just, just tell me how you feel. And immediately, Nicole says... I, I can't explain it, but I'm getting sad. I've got tears in my eyes, but I can't explain it. And I always try to get the emotions away from that. I said, you don't feel anything else. No, I don't feel anything else. So I guided her away, just a few feet away, you know, and, and I backed Kylie up. I guided her back here just a couple feet in front of the grave. And before I could say, tell me how you feel, before I could get any of that out, I had to grab onto her because she started sobbing so hard she was ready to drop to her knees. And it was just, wow. it was bizarre. So I led her away from the grave and she said, I don't know what happened. I was just so sad. I, I couldn't help myself. So anyhow, Nicole told me, she said, you know, what's really weird is I'm the emotional one, but Kylie's mm -hmm. the one that mm -hmm. fell to pieces. So later that night, we're coming back over to pick up the, um, the tape recorder I had over here. And as we're walking back in the recording, you can hear, um, first you'll hear Kylie say, what time is it? I forgot to look because we were just back at my vehicle. And you hear the stepdad say, it's 1.30. Immediately you hear Nicole say 1.50. And then you hear this clear whisper say, can I swing it? And it sounds like an adolescent child. What time did the phone say for that? I didn't know. About 1.30. 1.50. 
I'm wondering whether the, the ladies are picking up on the, the mother. Well, one, the one mother's coming here. And that's, I'm glad you said that because right. one lady I brought out here, um, again, she knew nothing about it. She's standing here, and she did the whole thing where she started sobbing. And I said, well, how did you feel? I mean, do you know why do you think it's the little boy? She goes, no. She goes, I was getting like a mother's sadness. Yeah, yeah. What's sad? You can see the name. But when the cousin contacted me, she called him a nickname or a shortened version of that name. Right. And one of the things we recorded here, it says that name first. Yes, yeah, yeah. It, it says, like, it's blank girl. Right, we'll that leave. Did you see they still bring items to his grave? Yes. Yeah. 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 So, so he was well loved. You've been listening to Cuckoo Town, a Leviathan Media production. Copyright Mark Anthony Wyatt, 2022. The Cuckoo Song is performed by Mark. If you enjoyed the show, please like, subscribe, and share for updates and more. You won't want to miss what we have coming up next. Don't forget to tell all your friends about Cuckoo Town. Find us on all major media platforms. Thanks for listening. See you next time when we'll take another stroll down a road less traveled. Be lucky. Be lucky. You can find Larry Wilson's books on Amazon. There is one that is dedicated to Williamsburg Hill, also known as Will Hill. It's called Strange Williamsburg Hill. I highly recommend Larry's books. I've read several of them. When you read them, it feels like you are there with him at these creepy locations. It's probably best to not read them in bed, though. They might give you nightmares. Over cuckoo, she's a pretty bird. She warbles as she flies. But she never hollers cuckoo until the fourth day of July. Jack of diamonds, Jack of diamonds, you're the meanest heart I know. Well, you up my poor pockets, my silver and gold. I'm going up on a mountain, gonna build me a whiskey still. And I'll sell you one bottle for a $20 bill. Stand there looking down So I can see my pretty baby Whenever she comes around Over oh, cuckoo, she's a pretty bird She warbles as she flies And she never hollers cuckoo Until the fourth day of July